Okay, and thank you very much for um, the invitation. Um, it's early in the morning here, but I, I've been on the east coast of the United States for several weeks, so it was I, I've been up for a while. <laughs> um, yeah, so one of the big thrusts in my research group is what I like to call um, stroboscopic energy flow microscopy, following how energy of different forms moves through materials. Uh, and the most recent way that we've been doing that is uh, developing methodologies that I view as uh, stemming from uh, optical scattering. I, I guess we can all probably agree that's the most a uh, general way to describe light matter interactions and then build up transmission and reflection and absorption by principle of superposition. Um, scattering is often with optics thought of as a double-edged sword because we see everything whether we want to or not. Um, but we've been using this uh, to our advantage to not only follow how electronic forms of energy move through materials, which is typically what's done with the sort of zoology of uh, stroboscopic energy flow microscopies, uh, but also more recently to look at how, uh, uh, look at heat transport in materials and even um, how mass transport in, in solution um, uh, occurs. Uh, so I think of this all as being possible thanks to just the way that um, we can modify the index of refraction of the, the media in which we're uh, operating. Okay, so I'll give you a, a bit more of a flavor uh, for this. Um, so when I say optical stroboscopic energy flow microscopy, uh, basically uh, what I mean is this sort of collection of techniques that uh, my lab and a number of other labs around the world have been developing over the past decade or so. Um, there are some things that they all have in common. Uh, so we're all, of course, following stroboscopically uh, the spatiotemporal evolution uh, of uh, an initially uh, usually diffraction limited uh, photo excitation uh, in uh, some material. Uh, so I'll often refer to that excitation as being composed of a series of energy carriers, and we generate that through a microscope objective. Um, there are many different forms of contrast in these forms of microscopy. So they're transient absorption based. Uh, approaches that are transient photoluminescence-based approaches, and um, and I'll focus primarily today on transient scattering-based approaches, um, which uh, is what my lab has been focusing on the most in the past uh, few years. Um, so this is, I know, a part of the whole webinar series. Uh, uh, iScat, uh, iScat was something that really motivated us to uh, pursue this work and to develop this form of uh, energy flow imaging. Uh, essentially, I'm assuming everybody here is probably somewhat familiar with how iSCAT works, uh, but instead of following um, the behavior, the presence of individual particles uh, in the material, uh, we're basically trying to do the same thing with uh, let's say quasi particles by first photo exciting and then using iSCAT as a probe. Uh, so because of that, we call this technique stroboscat. This is something that Milan Delore, uh, former postdoc, uh, well, while he was a postdoc in my lab, this is what we developed. Now he's a, uh, on the faculty at Columbia and doing very interesting work with all sorts of exotic uh, quasi particles. Um, so we first uh, impulsively create energy carriers in a material in a very small spot, and then we probe in wide field. So we're basically looking at how uh, those energy carriers are uh, modifying the local uh, optical polarizability of uh, the material that we're trying to study. Uh, and uh, we do this um, differentially. So we're comparing what we observe uh, with the pump on to what we observe with the pump off. Uh, and this is something uh, that has allowed us to very rapidly characterize energy transport in a wide range of materials, uh, primarily semiconductors, but also conductors uh, and conventional semiconductors, uh, unconventional and emerging semiconductors and so forth. Uh, and you'll note here, uh, we have uh, charge carriers, we have uh, bound uh, electron hole pairs or excitons, uh, heat, and I'll show a tiny little bit about sound and, and ions as well. Uh, this is basically a log-log plot 
of the mean squared expansion of the initially uh, generated photo excitation spot as a function of time over uh, many decades. Uh, and in a matter of, let's say, like 10 minutes or so, uh, it's possible to achieve single digit nanometer sensitivity to um, uh, the changes in uh, the size of this uh, evolving distribution here. Uh, so to give you just a, an example of that with charge carriers, this is a polycrystalline uh, semiconductor, it's kind of hard to see that from looking at the uh, energy flow within it, uh, but I'll, I'll unpack that in a little bit more detail on the next slide. Uh, what's interesting to note, of course, is that uh, so we have dark contrast, we have uh, light contrast, uh, and that's relative to a sort of gray background. Uh, so this is the interferometric aspect of the technique, and this ends up being extremely valuable to us. Um, Okay, so to unpack that in a little bit more detail, um, the polycrystalline semiconductor that we were studying in this work uh, was uh, metal halide uh, perovskite film. Uh, and so uh, these are materials that I'm sure many people are, are familiar with, uh, but they're uh, uh, candidate materials for um, uh, much more energy efficient uh, creation of uh, photovoltaics. Uh, or more efficient photovoltaics in tandem with silicon. Uh, so we're very interested to know how charge carriers move in these sorts of materials. There was a sort of uh, paradox uh, in the field uh, in that uh, if one measured the uh, resistivity across grain boundaries uh, in the material uh, at the surface, at least, uh, the res resistivity was infinite. Uh, and that begged the question of how is it that charge carriers are able to move from one crystalline grain to another. Uh, what we discovered in this work and what you're seeing in all of these uh, funny shapes here uh, is that the charge carrier contrast uh, is changing as they, the charge carrier distribution moves deeper beneath uh, the surface of the material where the light is absorbed. Uh, until it's possible to find some spot along the interface between two different grains where uh, it's possible to, to, to cross uh, from one grain to the next. Uh, so there's a lot of additional uh, corroborating evidence for that that I'm not showing. The most important part uh, is that in the same microscope, we're able to correlate the, the structure of the material, so where the grain boundaries are, uh, with... Um, the energy flow maps that we're obtaining in the material. And all of these light spots that you see in the contrast correspond to the location of the grain boundaries. So we're basically using this technique and the interferometric aspect of it and the path length changes associated with our scattering distribution in order to do that. Um, we also are, are generally measuring um, lateral transport. So if I look along uh, various uh, different uh, directions, uh, rather than uh, see uh, normal diffusion like I would see in a single crystal, which is also what you see over here, um, I see these piecewise behaviors. So for example, it begins, let's say we take this yellow trace uh, with diffusive transport, and then this pause here uh, signifies, you know, these charge carriers searching <laughs> deeper into the material uh, until uh, you know they can find a place to actually cross laterally, and then you can see that uh, diffusive transport kicks back up again until everything is trapped. Uh, that's what the flat lines mean. Uh, we've used this to explore the connection between uh, the morphology of materials and uh, the transport in materials uh, uh, it, to to you know I guess. Uh, at very different scales. So here I was talking about grain boundaries, uh, but uh, we've also looked in the same sort of family of materials, but with different morphologies um, at uh, the role of, of various point defects. So for example, uh, here uh, we were looking at um, bundles of ultra thin nanowires of the material. Uh, and the transport that we observed was diffusive initially and then um, flatlined, as you see here. Uh, but uh, where it flatlined and you know at what time uh, uh, and as a function of which uh, carrier densities and so forth taught us uh, that these ultra-thin uh, nanowires 
uh, were perfectly crystalline and really the only uh, traps in the material were at the end facets. Um, also looking at uh, uh, point defects, but in this case, uh, vacancies uh, in the material, we were able to um, uh, uh, saturate those uh, uh, traps in the material uh, with uh, higher fluences uh, to obtain the intrinsic transport properties of the material were there no defects, and then compare that to the trap-limited transport uh, that we observe uh, once the, uh, the energy carrier density, in this case charge carriers, uh, has uh, decreased. So what I mainly wanted to point out, looking at electronic forms of transport, uh, with this slide is that there's this whole uh, collection of different piecewise behaviors that we'll often see when we follow the mean squared expansion of the uh, initial distribution that we uh, create in the material by pumping with a diffraction limited laser pulse. Uh, and we're getting better and better at being able to classify them according to uh, whether uh, we're seeing uh, something larger in structure uh, or something very, very small in structure that's much smaller than what we can spatially resolve, um, but we can see what the impacts of all of those different um, sort of defects happen to be. Okay, um, but I wanted to uh, move on to talk about uh, thermal aspects of transport and materials as well. Um, so uh, this is something that uh, just considering heat alone, uh, we were able to study in order to see transport effects on the nanoscale uh, associated with voids. Uh, so in this work, uh, James uh, was just looking at um, these films of uh, uh, gold uh, nanoparticles uh, that had voids in them. Uh, they were uh, more than one layer thick. Um, this is just a, a simulation here. Uh, but what he discovered is that the transport was subdiffusive. Uh, and that we could actually recover diffusive transport either by uh, looking at you know, just like a sputtered gold film or uh, by uh, sort of transforming uh, the um, data that we had from the film with the voids in it uh, into, uh, let's say, geodesic space. So basically, um, you know, if so long as the heat is able to travel through contiguous material um, microscopically, that would be diffusive. Uh, interestingly, when we exchange the ligands on these nanocrystals uh, to be uh, very short inorganic molecules, what we saw in addition to the thermal transport uh, was a ballistic sound wave that was emanating from uh, the center. And so uh, that shows that this material is much more strongly mechanically coupled uh, than um, the material with more standard organic ligands. And so this allows us to probe those sorts of properties of materials too. Um, one thing that's been really valuable to us is to not only look at uh, charge-based transport or heat-based transport uh, in isolation, uh, but also to look at those together. Uh, and that's something that uh, we initially did um, in uh, few layer transition metal dichalcogenide and molybdenum disulfide uh, in collaboration with Harry Atwater's group. Uh, and so in this work, what we saw is that uh, the heat, uh, at least at these two probe wavelengths that I'm showing you, um, uh, has a dark contrast. We can tune the sign of the contrast uh, for the excitons in the material, which is light here, um, uh, based on which side of a resonance or the band edge of, of the semiconductor uh, we're sitting. Um, and whereas there are some wavelengths which are far more sensitive to those electronic resonances, like I'm showing here on this top row, uh, there are other places Hannah discovered where we only see the heat. Uh, and so Hannah developed a strategy to basically do arithmetic with these different movies that we were making at uh, different probe wavelengths uh, so that we could fully isolate the electronic dynamics. Um, from the perspective of doing ultrafast spectroscopy and the electronic and optical properties of materials, it's uh, um, no secret that you know whenever you generate uh, these charge excitations, the materials are not perfectly quantum efficient, and so you're always generating heat. Uh, and often those spectra are very challenging to interpret, 
Uh, I think in particular, some of the effects that are often attributed to uh, electronic forms of excitations may also be related to heat. So this gave us the, the power to fully decouple those and to determine the true nature of the uh, excitonic behavior uh, in the material. Uh, and um, we're excited that the sensitivity that we have to changes in temperature in the material is about 100 millikelvin, and that we have you know, optical spatial resolution uh, when we do these sorts of measurements. So I think that uh, in terms of following energy uh, transport and materials, uh, this is useful from the perspective of uh, not only looking at heat dissipation and making sure it's not uh, conflated with uh, charge carrier dynamics, um, but also potentially in harnessing heat uh, to do useful work in thermoelectrics. Um, one uh, potential, uh, oh, actually, let me let me talk about this very briefly before I go on to that. Um, so it, it really is true that we can see heat and charge in pretty much any material if we try hard enough, for example, by photo exciting above the band gap. And so we've done some benchmarking work uh, in let's say silicon, as is shown here. And in this particular case, um, there's a fairly substantial separation of time scales for the thermal transport uh, and the uh, uh, charge carrier transport. Uh, and that allowed us to isolate the charge carrier transport on its own and look at carrier carrier scattering effects uh, that were essentially um, uh, diminishing uh, the, um, the diffusivity of, of the charge carriers. Okay, so what I what I wanted to mention in, in connection, at least loose connection with uh, thermoelectrics, um, is some work that we've been doing in uh, an elemental semiconductor black phosphorus. You can think of it, you know, to some extent, the same way we think of graphene, except that it is a semiconductor, and the band gap of the material uh, can be tuned uh, by changing how many layers of the material um, uh, you have, so it can be exfoliated. Um, this material is very uh, anisotropic structurally, uh, so we often talk about uh, the zigzag uh, direction in the material and the armchair uh, direction. Uh, it's kind of hard to see the zigzag, but that's because the, the atoms are actually zigzagging down uh, that direction. The armchair might be a little bit more clear as this uh, corrugation, and that changes uh, the charge carrier and thermal transport properties in the material. Uh, so this is just a ground state image here, and Steph was probing, you know, right around uh, this spot. Uh, so she's labeled for us uh, the armchair in the zigzag directions at a very early time of one picosecond. Um, so here's, uh, you know, a representative sample of the rest of the data series that she collected. And what you'll note is that in this case, the light contrast is uh, the charge and uh, the material is this bulk black phosphorus and the dark contrast is heat. Uh, but you can uh, see that there's an anisotropy in the mean squared expansion of the charge along uh, this armchair direction. It's uh, uh, greater than along this zigzag direction and that the opposite is true uh, for the heat. Uh, so we can quantify that more explicitly. Um, in the case of the charge carriers, uh, the preferential direction is the armchair direction and by about a factor of, of four to one. Uh, in the case of the heat, um, the anisotropy is somewhat lesser, but it's uh, about a factor of two to one and uh, it's biased along that zigzag uh, direction. Um, we were really interested to see what might happen as we uh, not only looked at uh, bulk black phosphorus, but compared it to uh, what we would obtain in the monolayer limit. Um, so now I'll just focus on the charge carriers, although in principle we can do the same thing with the heat. Um, so this is the data that I just showed you, um, where we had this four to one uh, uh, anisotropy ratio in the charge carrier transport. Uh, and then in the monolayer, um, interestingly, uh, the well, it's actually easier to see in this bar chart. Uh, so the um, the values that we get for the diffusivity along uh, both of the directions are actually higher. So here and here, uh, uh, even though now we're talking about bound electron hole pairs or excitons, uh, 
Um, and uh, the anisotropy ratio is lesser. Uh, so this is quite interesting to us. We're not exactly uh, sure of the very best way to explain it uh, yet and need to think a little bit more about uh, the band structure and, um, and uh, the scattering times in the material and so forth. Um, but it does sort of beg the question of, you know, if we were trying to optimize uh, using black phosphorus uh, for various devices, how many layers would we want so that we could maximize both the absolute uh, value of uh, the transport and also the, the anisotropy ratio, so balance those two things. Okay, um, here's another sort of example uh, where, of course, again, we see both heat and charge. Uh, in this particular case, uh, we're looking at uh, polarons as the charge carriers. So these are uh, charge carriers that uh, distort their lattice uh, in a polar semiconductor uh, copper iron oxide, which is uh, shown here in the top uh, right corner. So this is like hematite, um, which is a very common uh, material that's used uh, as a photocatalyst uh, in solar fuels generation. So for example, trying to make uh, small molecules, um, you know, using sunlight uh, to photo excite the material and let's say doing something like reducing uh, CO2. Um, so my, my collaborator, Scott Cushing at Caltech, uh, who does XUV on these materials, uh, was interested to know if the binding energies that he was measuring for these polarons, these self-trapped uh, uh, charge carriers, uh, the extent to which uh, that correlated with the transport in these materials, because you know if they're very heavily trapped, so basically they're really strongly distorting their lattices, uh, then they're having to constantly like move uh, by sort of parting the wake and uh, and moving along with those lattice distortions. Um, in uh, in the case of copper iron oxide, uh, compared to uh, iron oxide, what we can say preliminarily is that, um, yes, it, it does appear based on the slopes of these, uh, the average slopes, let's say, of these curves, uh, that copper iron oxide does uh, have a stronger polar on transport. Uh, what I'm sure you'll note here is that uh, we've basically launched these uh, these photoacoustic modulations in our sample <laughs> at the same time. And so now we're thinking carefully about uh, the best way to either not do that or uh, to carefully uh, remove those oscillations. And I, I, I want to emphasize here, these are not um, the like population dynamics as one would obtain in like a transient reflectance measurement. Um, this is in the mean squared expansion. So basically, uh, it's kind of hard to see in these data here, but we're seeing a breathing uh, that's occurring. Um, and, and the proper way, in my view, to interpret this, although it's still a work in progress, is that uh, our contrast is showing us um, two different um, like uh, forms of energy that have two uh, different behaviors and they're superposed on one another and we need to be very cautious about how uh, we discern them. Uh, in the same, in the similar sort of way that we discern, let's say, heat and charge. Okay, um, there are lots of other things I suppose I could tell you about this, but I think that's the most important part for uh, perhaps this audience. I'll we'll just also potentially mention something interesting, which is that in uh, copper iron oxide, uh, hematite, and also uh, this other analog, copper bismuth uh, oxide. Uh, at very early times uh, when we're making these measurements, uh, we see um, in many cases what, what appear to be like very high apparent diffusivities. And um, I'm not sure that it would be safe to interpret what we're observing as just that, um, but it is quite interesting to think about um, how having um, non uh, thermalized phonon distributions in these materials at these very short times is impacting what we observe. Um, and so that's a work in progress, but something that I view as being very interesting. Um, so what I just described uh, was basically one side of what we need to understand to um, have a mechanistic picture of solar fuels generation. 
and namely what happens when we photo excite uh, uh, a semiconductor and you know, we want the charge carriers to make their way to an interface typically with the uh, solution uh, phase electrolyte. On the other side, uh, we've been doing uh, work without photo excitation, but essentially you could think of this as iSCAD or perhaps uh, given the fact that we're not looking at individual point particles or distributions, uh, interference reflection microscopy uh, in order to follow mass transport in solution so that we can ultimately follow how whatever the products of photoelectrochemical reactions are, uh, are basically we wanna know what they are, <laughs> we wanna identify them um, with this sort of approach. Uh, and also uh, use transport as a way to do that identification. Uh, so by adding, um, in this case, uh, like salts uh, to a solution, um, one uh, can very sensitively change its refractive index. Uh, in this particular case, for a proof of concept, uh, we used a ferrocyanide redox couple. So we're just running a very simple electrochemical reaction. Uh, and when we apply a bias across uh, the trench that we made in this sort of microfluidic uh, cover slip with uh, electrodes uh, vertically along the sidewalls, uh, we're able to uh, see this um, a linear gradient form in the contrast uh, uh, in the images that we obtain. Uh, we can also follow the evolution uh, to that steady state. So with uh, basically without a model uh, for any electrochemistry at all, follow the mean squared expansion of uh, the products as they're coming off of the um, uh, electrodes. And that has allowed us to extract the correct diffusivity for the products, knowing already what they are. And of course, now we want to be able to apply this to uh, look at other solutes uh, as products in more sophisticated chemical reactions. Um, and it's very cool to me that we're we're so sensitive to these. We can see, you know, like sub millimolar amounts uh, of whatever, even when we have various combinations of solutes in the solution. Of course, having uh, imaging capabilities can also allow us to look at irregularities, so that we know uh, not only in bulk what's happening in uh, a very complex reaction, but also how and where and why and so forth. Um, maybe I'll just end by uh, saying that I was just talking about what's often called artificial photosynthesis. One of the uh, dreams of my lab from its inception, um, I don't know, a decade and a half ago, is uh, to be able to answer the question of why the very first picoseconds of uh, natural photosynthesis uh, have this energy transport process that is so incredibly efficient. This is the process uh, in which light is absorbed in chlorophyll molecules uh, at one spot uh, within a chloroplast, uh, and that light energy is converted to excitons. And those excitons find their way somehow to dedicated locations for um, the initiation of downstream biochemistry, the so-called reaction centers. So we very recently have been able to uh, measure uh, exciton transport in uh, photosynthetic membranes that come from spinach in this case, uh, and do some control experiments where we either open or close these reaction centers where the biochemistry is initiated. We don't yet completely follow exactly why we get the numbers that we get, um, but uh, there are a lot of different um, uh, biofeedback processes that occur to dissipate um, excess electronic energy is heat uh, in these systems uh, rather than um, creating um, uh, singlet oxygen that um, breaks all the carbon-carbon bonds. Uh, and so there are a series of additional experiments that we'll do in order to uh, follow those sorts of processes or eradicate those processes that are called non-photochemical quenching. And I think our ability to be able to see heat if we're sensitive enough to seeing it here, uh, will be incredibly valuable in order to understand how these processes work. Okay, so I mentioned at the beginning that you know optical scattering can be a double-edged sword. Um, and I think that we're getting uh, to a point where we're able to distinguish different forms of energy uh, that we photogenerate in materials uh, so that we're able to classify them appropriately and analyze them carefully. 
Uh, and uh, whereas in most cases, uh, stroboscopic energy photo microscopies have focused primarily on electronic forms of energy, um, I've just shown you how we can do this with ions, or they don't need to be charged, solute species to so look at mass transport, uh, and also how we can do the same sort of thing uh, with heat transport, and that there are some very peculiar effects that we observe at short times with non-thermal distributions that we're interested to go after as well. So with that, um, I'll close by uh, thanking uh, my uh, group and my collaborators for their talent and, and dedication. Um, and uh, if there's time, I'm happy to answer some questions. Yeah, thank you very much for your nice talk. So it's open for questions. Uh, you can write in the chat or you can just directly speak. Okay, maybe I, I start uh, um, the, for this hematite uh, measurements where you see some kind of acoustic oscillation. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of frequency is this? It's, so it's coming from breathing mode, you, you said, right? So I, I think it's, it's basically, it's like a, um, we're, we're basically launching either a standing or a traveling wave, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, out of plane uh, in the material as is very common. Uh, and um, the, the frequency, uh, so it depends on whether it's hematite or the copper iron oxide, but yeah. it's always around 10 gigahertz. Okay. Yeah. I think Funk has a question, Funk. Yeah. I, I was wondering, so in most cases you show or you explain uh, the, the whole dynamics with diffusive dynamics. And I was wondering if you ever enter a regime where it could be ballistic or non-diffusive. I mean, um... yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, the the one example of something that uh well i guess there are two examples i showed of uh of of this that were really quick let me show you a, a sort of um a slide i didn't show that unpacks that in a little bit more detail um just give me a moment for my computer to respond um okay so yeah so and for my cursor to come back. <laughs> um, so this is just basically showing what I, I showed uh, in a very short vignette, but in a little bit more detail. Um, so uh, on the one hand, if there are voids in a material, um, then we've measured something that is definitely not diffusive, that's subdiffusive, right? Um, on the other hand, if the material is more, it's not gushy, <laughs> let's say if it has like a, a bigger modulus, um, then uh, we have been able to measure, um, you know, uh, ballistic transport. Oh, okay. so, yeah, I see. Yeah. So we see whatever there is to see. In many cases, it's sort of piecewise diffusive. Um, um, but but in, in the, and, and that's probably what it would look like in this case if, if we if our photo excitation spots were nanoscopic instead of microscopic, right? Um, so it always depends on what scale we're looking and what we might be averaging over. Um, but yeah, we can. So, so we could one for, sorry, uh, could one for example, for the subdiffusive behavior, um, uh, relate the exponent to the, the uh, structure of the material dimensionality? Yes. Of yeah, absolutely. Um, I can't remember if we actually did that um, in in this uh, in this paper from 2021 uh, or not. Um, I remember discussing it with James, <laughs> um, but absolutely, uh, I think we might have uh, said something about what we envisioned the characteristic scale of the voids would have to be in order to generate um, the the exponent that that we observed. Um, but yeah, just like um, I showed with, okay, we see certain effects with grain boundaries, which are larger scale uh, defects and other things with uh, point defects here. I mean, this is something sort of like intermediate between those and, and we should be able to get even like a, a, st a statistical uh, distribution of like the, the, the size and shape of voids based on, um, you know, the measurements we're making provided that, um, that we we have su substantial enough spatial resolution to to not average over too much. 
And I guess one other thing I should point out when I start talking about resolutions, I often talk about the resolution and sensitivity that we have as being quite different when we're talking about measuring transport. We're using diffraction limited uh, light pulses. Here, uh, there's other work that we've done where we've photo excited sub diffraction spots, but, um, but we have very high sensitivity in measuring um, changes to the width of the distribution that we create. So that's what we have typically with like uh, just like a few nanometer. Uh, and it's just a, it's because ISCAT is shot noise limited. And so the longer we want to measure, the, the better we can do. Great. Thank you.